demonize the president every chance we get. But the crisis isn't over yet. I think this crisis is being overplayed. Piano, piano. The FBI says it's investigating more deliveries of packages that appear to contain pipe bombs. Two were addressed to former Vice President Joe Biden in Delaware and a third to Robert De Niro in New York. Since Monday, 10 packages have been pulled out of the mail, all addressed to prominent critics of President Trump. Vice News spoke with one of the intended recipients, former Attorney General Eric Holder. We are a divided nation now, and um, the possibility exists that somebody who's on the fringe could be motivated to do something uh, on the basis of the way in which you know, an elected official conducts himself. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis is ordering 800 troops to the U.S.-Mexico border, as first reported by CNN. As a caravan of migrants head north, Trump has vowed to send the military, calling the caravan a national emergency. But any troops deployed will be stuck in support roles. The law bars active duty soldiers from acting as police. A British watchdog fined Facebook $645,000 for its role in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. That's the highest fine that Britain's information commissioner can issue. But Facebook got lucky. If they'd exposed user data after May, when the EU's general data protection laws went into effect, the company might have been on the hook for $22 million. Ethiopia appointed its first female president, Zahle Workswede, making her the only female head of state in Africa. She was appointed by Prime Minister Abe Ahmed after he reshuffled his cabinet, giving women half the positions. China fired back at a New York Times report that claims its spies are listening in when President Trump uses his unsecure iPhones. The Trump administration banned government employees from using phones made by the Chinese manufacturer after Congress labeled them a security risk. Trump also disputed the report by saying he prefers hardline telephones in a tweet sent from an iPhone. After it was revealed that Russia used Facebook as its primary tool for spreading disinformation and sowing division in America, and after Mark Zuckerberg initially called the idea of Russian influence pretty crazy, Facebook pledged to get really serious about foreign influence and transparency. Going forward, and maybe the most important step we're taking, is we're going to make political advertising more transparent. As part of this effort, Facebook added a paid-for box at the top of political ads that's supposed to do exactly what it says, show who paid for the ad. With the midterms less than two weeks away, we tested it out, and the results suggest Facebook's not meeting that higher standard of transparency. In fact, we received approval to buy political ads on Facebook and claimed they were paid for by major political figures. In just about an hour, they passed Facebook's approval process. Vice President Mike Pence Approved. Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez. Approved. The Islamic State. Approved. Hillary Clinton. Actually, that one got denied. But when we asked Facebook why, they didn't explain. Even after that, we were still able to place more political ads. All we had to do was provide the company with valid ID and proof of residence. Facebook knew who was behind the ads internally. But externally, what the users would see was completely made up, paid for information. Even though in our small sample, this feature clearly doesn't work, Facebook touted it as a win for transparency in a glossy video this week. As long as I can remember, every radio ad, every TV ad that touched politics always ended with a disclaimer, paid for by or brought to you by. And there was never anything that was systematic that delivered the same kind of visibility into who paid for paid political content on Facebook until today. In a response to our experiment, a Facebook spokeswoman said these ads should have never been approved because what we wrote in the paid for box was a lie. But if we hadn't reached out to Facebook, it's unclear if the company would have noticed. Facebook also provided us with a statement from Rob Leather, who leads their business integrity product management team, which said, quote, enforcement isn't perfect, 
and we won't stop all the people trying to game the system, but we have made it much harder and we will continue to improve. A Facebook spokesperson also told us it is, quote, developing closer relationships with election authorities who are experts on the law and can flag potentially non-compliant disclaimers for us to take action. That response begs the question, if Facebook hadn't fully developed those relationships yet, why did it launch this feature in the first place? Oh, and one more thing. Not only did we make up who paid for our ads, our ads were exact copies of the ones placed by Russian agents during the 2016 election. Facebook says the actual content of our ads didn't violate its policies, but the fact that we lied about who paid for them did violate its rules. But because our paid for disclosure was Mike Pence, we made sure it never ran because we're not Mike Pence. President Trump is campaigning in the midterms the way he campaigned for president, by using lies and unproven claims to get his supporters fired up. Republicans will always protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. We're going to be uh, putting in a 10% tax cut for middle income families. You're going to find MS-13, you're going to find Middle Eastern, you're going to find everything. And guess what? We're not allowing them in our country. It's more of the same from a man who got his start in politics by searching for Obama's birth certificate and promising to make Mexico pay for a wall that's still unfunded. But Democrats are still grappling with the same problem when it comes to Trump. What do you say about a man who will say anything? For the most part, the answer is, don't say anything at all. At a campaign rally here in Orlando on Tuesday, Democratic Senator Bill Nelson, who's in a tight re-election fight with the state's GOP governor, mostly avoided mention of the president, focusing instead on health care and the environment. What do we have? Red tide and green algae. Even some of Florida's more liberal Democrats, like Anna Eskamani, who's running for state representative here, didn't go directly after Trump. We can and we must return to an age of sanity, a time when Americans, and I mean all Americans, still not divided, but united. A time of integrity and decency. A time when we could disagree without being disagreeable. Eskamani said she's careful to focus on issues because she doesn't want to turn off potential Republican supporters. And sometimes the focus on Trump can distract. We lost a lot of voters to Trump in 2016. I'm honored to say that on our campaign, as a progressive Democrat, we've attracted Republican supporters and no party affiliation supporters alongside our Democrats. And again, that's because we focus on the issues. We don't demonize the president every chance we get. A lot of sort of Democratic Party leaders um, do call out President Trump, but it creates headlines, it creates sort of a news cycle. Yeah. Um, do you consider that a distraction, a problem for your campaign? You have to be reactionary to some degree. I mean, you can't let the president say um, things that are offensive or hurtful towards working families and not hold them accountable to it. So there are leaders in the political world that play that role, and I, I do think it's a necessary role to play, but it does serve as a distraction. You'd expect that kind of thing from a Democrat running in a purple state even in a blue wave. You don't expect it from the heavyweights. Which is why on Tuesday in Orlando, the surprise was former Vice President Joe Biden, who's been memorably plain spoken about Trump before. The press always asks me, don't I wish I were debating him? No, I wish we were in high school, I could take him behind the gym. That's what I wish. But now that Biden's thinking about a presidential run himself, instead of throwing punches, he pulled them letting a conservative columnist do the work. David Brooks, he's a conservative columnist, but he talks about these basic American values being shredded by a president who's put his own interest before the country's interest. His biggest complaint about Trump's embrace of white nationalism was that it was a trick used to prey on struggling communities. Preying on the hopelessness and despair in communities under great stress, folks. Not a joke. Our children are listening. And our silence is complicity. We cannot let this stand. The world is watching Biden well. did talk about the division in the country, outrageous. but he used 2008 rhetoric for a 2018 problem. 
Democrats have to choose hope over fear, unity over division. We have to choose our allies over our enemies. This is one of the Democrats' most famous brawlers acting out the party's 2018 line. Harmony and restraint for the winnable Republican voters. Over red meat and fury for the base. This is the United States of America. There's nothing we cannot do, and I mean it. I mean it. So get up. Take it back. Restore this country to its rightful place. Today, CIA Director Gina Haspel briefed President Trump on what she's learned about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Haspel's just returned from a fact-finding trip to Turkey, where, according to the Washington Post, she was allowed to listen to secret recordings of the murder being carried out in the Saudi consulate. The Saudis, for their part, have changed their story yet again, acknowledging today that the murder was premeditated, not, as they formally claimed, the result of a fistfight gone wrong. And in what appeared to be a concession, the Saudi government allowed Khashoggi's son Salah and his family to leave the country after shaking hands with the king on state TV. On the final day of the Future Investment Initiative, leaders assured the financial world that the kingdom will soon be back to the usual business of making money. Vice News hasn't been allowed to film openly here, but we were able to speak to financial analyst Mohammed al Swayed, who attended the conference. Walking around the conference, speaking to people, overhearing conversations, were people talking about the current political crisis? Well, there probably there were some talk, but I haven't really heard about heard it. <laughs> uh, everybody was busy talking about the business. Everything went well, really great. A lot of people, like, were having a uh, good time. But the crisis isn't over yet, so there is still a risk that in the future there'll be more political instability. I think this really this crisis is being overplayed. Um, you know, I trust in our leaders, I trust in our government system. We're bothered about what happened, but uh, we don't think that's going to affect the uh, political situation. But there are lines coming out of Turkey every single day, and uh, Saudi Arabia's own investigation keeps changing. Won't that have an impact on the economy and the stability of Saudi Arabia in the future? Will that turn investors away? I don't think the economy would be impacted with any of those uh, prices at the moment. Even if blame was to go high up? I can tell you, for, you know, uh, that the reality today is that most of the execution uh, entities within the government today, uh, the decision-making uh, process is happening actually bottom-up. It's not top-down. What about businesses, external businesses coming in? Do you think they'll think twice about investing if there's more risk? Well, they have been thinking twice about investing since the 1980s. I mean, it's the political risk in the region. has It's been there all along. It's not new uh, to the Middle East. Saudi has been trying to stabilize the region since ever, I think. So when you're we saying talk, that Saudi so Arabia will be more of a, a stabilizing it is. partner it is. in the region rather than the other it way? It has been a stabilizing region. I mean, just read the history. Just read the... Uh, the the whole relationship between Saudi and the U.S. Jair Bolsonaro is almost sure to win Brazil's presidential election this Sunday, putting an ultra-right-wing strongman in charge of the world's fourth largest democracy. He's positioned himself as an outsider, untouched by the corruption that's tainted every major party. But his campaign may do more to help the insiders who have long controlled Brazil, landowners. Rodrigo Basso's family owns more than 22,000 acres of farmland in Brazil's interior. My father is here for more than 40 years. I was born here. E hoje o negócio nosso é plantio de soja, milho e algodão. In March, he planted a huge message in a field of soy supporting Jair Bolsonaro. It even caught the attention of the man himself. Eu não votei na eleição de 2000 e na eleição de 2010, nem na eleição de 2014. Eu achava nem nem tinha opinião para, nem tinha opção para votar. Era tão tão descarado. Agora esse ano eu vou 
já votei no primeiro turno Bolsonaro, vou votar de novo. Why are you supporting Jair Bolsonaro for president? Pelo que ele representa na parte ética e moral para o país, sem conchavo partidário, político partidário. Daqui do campo, o primeiro é isso, é começar uma limpeza, tentar traçar um novo rumo com um país rico, que vocês estão vendo aí, de, de clima, de solo, com potencial... Tá limpando os pneus, né? Beleza. Pode tocar lá. Pode tocar. Like Basso, millions of people in Brazil see Bolsonaro as an agent of change. But there's a difference. The Basso family is part of the 1% that owns almost half of Brazil's land. And agribusiness is by far the strongest political force in the country. When big landowners look to Bolsonaro for change, it means change that will shore up their power. A gente era para estar maior que a China em, em, em economia. Temos capacidade para isso. A gente só não tem governo. E a gente estava indo para o rumo da Venezuela. Isso aí ninguém tem dúvida. E não é isso que a gente quer para o país, né? Agribusiness loves Bolsonaro because he's promised to sweep away many of the environmental and labor regulations that constrain their profits. Not that they need the help. Last year's agricultural revenues were the highest in Brazil's history. Bolsonaro has also promised to suppress social movements like the MST, an organization of landless peasants who camp out on unused farms to pressure the government to redistribute the land. Bolsonaro calls the MST terrorists and has urged landowners to shoot them, one of the reasons he wants to legalize guns. A população civil is already armed, she is not liberated. So, from the moment that there is an incitator and a person who will guarantee that this person who is armed makes atrocities without punishment, Então, isso provoca caos, isso provoca mortes. Although it took them longer than the farmers, the business and financial elite in Brazil's major cities have also lined up behind Bolsonaro, with the assurance that his advisor, Paulo Guedes, an investor and free market fundamentalist, shares their interests. Through Guedes, Bolsonaro has promised more austerity, privatization, and low taxes for the rich. O nosso país realmente está à beira do caos. Não podemos dar mais um passo à esquerda. O nosso passo agora é para o centro. But business leaders have been quiet about their position. Several of the most prominent declined our requests for interviews. They've avoided the spotlight even more since news broke last week that entrepreneurs had allegedly spent $3 million on an illegal scheme to spread pro-Bolsonaro propaganda on WhatsApp. Bolsonaro's opponents are trying desperately to point out that his economic proposals would only benefit the elite. But economic crises and corruption scandals have severely weakened the mainstream Brazilian left, and the message is not getting through. Still, a new generation of young socialists is trying to position itself as the actual alternative. Eu acredito que a corrupção no nosso país é um problema sistêmico, é da lógica como a política e a economia se desenvolvem no nosso país. É, o nosso país é baseado nessa relação. Is Bolsonaro credibly an anti-corruption candidate? Não, de jeito, de jeito nenhum. Como é que o Bolsonaro poderia ser um político anti-corrupção se ele é financiado, alimentado e apoiado pelos principais setores que mantêm a lógica econômica e a lógica de funcionamento do nosso Estado que é uma lógica corrupta, entende? Não tem como resolver o problema da economia fortalecendo banqueiros ou fortalecendo o agronegócio, porque eles já mandam na economia do nosso país e nunca adiantou de nada. Change means different things to different people. And for a few Brazilians, it means a new cast of characters running a system that remains essentially the same. Tá. Eu acho que pro campo, se ele não atrapalhar, não fizer nada, tá bom. Que como a gente falou, o O setor agrícola no Brasil, ele vem carregando o Brasil nas costas. Então, a gente tá bem. Do you worry that Bolsonaro himself might become corrupted? Eu acho muito improvável. É, o governo, eu não sei o que, o que vai ser daqui para frente, se ele vai ser eleito, como vai ser, o que vai acontecer. Isso aí ninguém tem certeza. Bola de cristal ninguém tem. Mas eu acho que a gente está tentando remar para o lado mais manso do, do rio, né?
Francesco. Sì. Dove si può andare con questa mano? Donna come... come... Oh, oh, oh. Perché non si va fuori e lo lancio sulle vite di Los Angeles? Hi, this is Andrea Bocelli. Discover my vice. Questo è un piccolo pezzo tratto dalla Carmen di Bizet. L'idea di ottenere delle note belle, un suono così dolce da un tubo di, di, di metallo, in buona sostanza, è una magia questa qui. Ce ne ho due. Questo è un flauto in platino e un altro flauto d'oro. Ho collezionato molti, sì, molti strumenti e mi fanno compagnia. Il vino è una passione di famiglia perché i miei antenati hanno iniziato a fare il vino direi nel 1831 e qui ho portato una bottiglia che è una bottiglia di San Giovese. Qui abbiamo dato il nome di Terre di Sandro perché Sandro era mio padre. Naturalmente quando sono in tournée non posso bere vino, oggi faccio una piccola eccezione. Io sono orgoglioso di poter dire di non essere mai stato ubriaco nella mia vita. Un po' di vino bevuto con moderazione aiuta a ritrovare quella leggerezza che ogni tanto la vita ci fa smarrire. Non si può bere il vino da soli. Salute. Mio nonno, pochi giorni prima di lasciarci, disse che aveva il desiderio di regalarmi un cavallino. Io ho cominciato ad andare a cavallo quando avevo otto anni, cadendo due o tre volte al giorno e poi per me forse sta diventando un vizio perché i cavalli sono anche costosi. In questo momento possiedo, mi sembra, otto cavalli. Fin da bambino ho pensato che quella sarebbe stata la mia strada. Poi ho incontrato un po' di difficoltà, non è stato facile. Facevo una musica che veniva giudicata antica, non lo so, superata. Forse non, forse non, non si riteneva che la mia persona fosse sufficientemente carismatica, non lo so. Cioè l'importante non è decidere cosa è bene o cosa non è bene cantare, l'importante è cantare bene quello che si canta. La fede è un argomento serio, quanto tempo mi date? <ride> a un certo punto credo che ciascuno di noi si trovi di fronte a un bivio e lì deve scegliere se, se, se deificare il caso o deificare qual qualcun altro. Siccome personalmente non ho mai creduto al caso, sono andato sulle orme di Dio, diciamo così. Certo è che per qualche ragione ci siamo. Il significato della vita è una cosa che scopriremo dopo. Generalmente, purtroppo, quando sono in, in tour, devo stare abbastanza chiuso in camera perché per salvaguardare la voce, per non prendere fresco, per non essere contagiato da raffreddori. Quindi approfitto in questi casi per leggere dei libri e se sono a casa do il libro sfogo alla fantasia. Sì.